What happened yesterday is a disgrace, and I, as an American, I'm embarrassed. You know, I didn't vote for Trump in 16. I voted for him in this past election, November. Today, I'm, I'm sorry I did that. So that man's name is Nelson Peltz. He was mad, he seemed sad, and he was, in his own words, sorry that he did that. And that was voting for Donald Trump, because after January 6th, sorry was what he thought to say. Now, here's why he matters. He's a Republican mega donor. He's got a lot of money. But he wasn't the only billionaire who felt that way, sorry, sad, mad, and voiced his outrage with what Trump did on January 6th. Such immediate regret in the aftermath of the deadly attack on the United States Capitol. In fact, the sentiments were, were, were common among what I would imagine to be someone like that's wealthy peer group, their yacht or wherever they hang out. But the passage of time has shown that even people like that who don't have financial concerns, that their disgust and what sounded like real anguish wasn't going to last, right? He didn't remain sorry about what he did. Because the Washington Post points out today that earlier this month, according to people with knowledge of that man, Nelson Peltz, he had breakfast with Donald Trump in Palm Beach alongside a bunch of other billionaires. And the man he just heard describe his personal embarrassment and remorse for voting for Trump in 2020 after January 6th happens, told the Financial Times that he is probably going to vote for Trump again in 24. But he's not alone. It's not just about him. Quote, after January 6th, billionaire developer Robert Bigelow said Trump had, quote, lost me as a supporter. He showed that in that particular hour, he was no commander. End quote. Well, that guy, Bigelow, has now pledged $20 million to a pro-Trump campaign group. And even more than that, he's funding his legal defense fund, according to Reuters. His firm did not respond to a request for comment on either of that. Now, while for many of these really, really, really wealthy people, the decision might come down to what they see as best for their massive bank accounts, right, and their holdings. Maybe they're worried about what President Joe Biden's tax policies mean for their businesses. But what they clearly fail to realize is this. If and when Donald Trump models a second term after the guys he really, really loves and talks about really, really loving, people like Viktor Orban and Vladimir Putin, dictators and despots, as he's made abundantly clear he will do, what that? What if their grandkids or their kids tweet something mean about Trump? And I think we already know just how very lethal autocracy is for capitalism. Joining this conversation, Professor of Sociology and International Affairs at Princeton University, Kim Shapley. I botched that. Kim, Kim Shapley is here. Her research examines the rise and fall of constitutional government. Also joining us, Professor of Philosophy at Yale University, author of six different books, including How Fascism Works, The Politics of Us and Them, Jason Stanley. And with me at the table, Daniela Ballou Aries, founder and CEO of the Leadership Now Project, a national membership organization of business and thought leaders who are committed to fixing American democracy. We'll start with the bright spot. How do you bring them in and make them want to protect our democracy? Thanks, Nicole. You know, I think we shouldn't see business as a monolith. There are many business leaders who are concerned with what's happening. Of course, there's some visible ones that you just talked about who are willing to trade off democracy for whatever their interest of the moment is. But what we really see is that there are quite a few business leaders who see the risks for their family and for their business of an autocratic uh, direction for this country. So it is not hard, actually, for us to find business leaders who are concerned. I think the important thing is then what do they do? that really can have an impact. And where we've seen a lot of that is in critical states like Wisconsin, states like Ohio, where business leaders are seeing day to day the impact of sliding democracy. Do, do any of them fail to see the threat? Or is it just a calculation of, of, of whether or not they want to be out there? I think it's not just a calculation of the, if they want to be out there, though that is part of it. I think the threat is clear. I think many business leaders see that uh, there is a threat. I think it's a calculation of how big a threat is it. Is it a threat that will be not as significant as 
a bit of chaos on the Hill, right? Uh, so one, some underestimate the threat. And then many are not sure if the population, if the polling is showing that Trump is popular, are they going to really have an impact by coming out? So I think part of what we've done is really create those pathways of here's the most important places you can engage. And what are those? Well, there's a very basic thing going on right now. I mean, that started in the lead up to the last election, which is undermining faith in elections. Mm -hmm. Th that is consistent. It is completely un-American. Um, and the vast majority of business leaders believe we should have faith in elections, polling would suggest. So we've done efforts to support poll workers, election officials, do amicus briefs when election administrators are being threatened in a state like Wisconsin, and really publicly support mm -hmm. the importance of faith in elections and participation. In Arizona, 80% of election workers have quit, which is unbelievable. I mean, they were being threatened in their homes. They're having to hide. So I think locally, the business leaders um, we work with there see that and are ready to come out. Others have been willing to more directly endorse Biden or come out against Trump. You saw Mark Cuban come out recently, et cetera. So I think we will see more of that. But at a minimum, we see the opportunity for business leaders to restore faith in elections. Kim, is it your sense that business leaders are um, at least peeking at or trying to understand what happened in Hungary when Orban ascended, what he did to industry or looking at, at Russia? Or, or what, what is your sense of, of, of the current state of thinking among most business leaders? Well, I don't think many business leaders have realized that this is not just business as usual with a slightly more chaotic candidate in the mix. When you look at what happened in Hungary, I think this is the kind of thing business leaders can learn from. Viktor Orban came in and he, like Donald Trump, is a very transactional guy. So the question isn't whether you support him today. The question is, what does he need from you and what can he get? So when Viktor Orban came to power, he started nationalizing sectors of the economy. And he did that, even though he's allegedly on the right. That's not the kind of thing that a right-wing populist typically does. But he did things like, um, for, for the companies that were providing um, natural gas deliveries to private homes, the government negotiated a price for the import of natural gas from Russia. And then they set a price for what it was that the distributors could charge to customers. And they set that up so that every single you know, cubic foot of gas that was pumped lost money for the companies, and they drove them out of business. They drove them out of Hungary. So one of the things you have to realize is that when these guys come into power, if they decide they either want to take over your business or they decide that they want to get back at you for something that you've done, they control a lot of levers. You know, They control le regulatory levers. They may control the courts, and the courts can then rule against you if you decide you want to sue them for something. So once you get an autocrat in power controlling all these levers, then it really isn't just a matter, you know, as I think American business leaders are used to, of buying access, of, you know, cozying up, and then you get something in exchange. I mean, no, these leaders are not playing by those kinds of rules, and they're determined to stay in power forever, and they may need to destroy your business to do it. And so, you know, we've seen that kind of thing in Hungary. I am concerned that kind of thing may come here. You know, Jason, the, the twist, the Trumpian twist would be, you know, or Orban appears to have been a methodical autocrat, right? I mean, it, it took some planning to do what Kim just articulated. Trump would be an arbitrary and capricious autocrat. I mean, he, he's attacking a sitting judge's daughter because of the clients her digital consulting firm has. If someone retweeted a Jon Stewart clip and their uh, you know, father or grandfather were a titan of business, it wouldn't shield them from his rage. I and mean, we know from Bill Barr and others that Trump sought to punish companies. He's talked about taking this company off the air. What is the, what is the sort of historical parallel that appropriately warns business leaders about the risks they face today? Well, I think we have contemporary parallels. As Kim pointed out, Orban is a contemporary parallel, someone who Trump has praised to high heavens. Uh, Vladimir Putin's personalist regime uh, in Russia, where he chooses the oligarchs, and oligarchs that cross him are imprisoned, uh, is another uh, good example. Uh, the current moment has historical precedence. Uh, business leaders in Germany in the early 1930s supported Hitler and the Nazis, thinking they could do certain work for them, like get rid of the labor unions or weaken their power. Uh, and they found out to their 
uh, concern that there was much more uh, facing them. Uh, now, Project 2025 is a blueprint for the second Trump term, and its first priority for the Department of Commerce is to replace uh, employees by make all decision making uh, done by political appointees. Uh, now, just imagine that. That's, they're supposed to provide us with independent uh, information about the economy. Instead, they'll be providing us with the kind of information used to justify whatever will increase Trump and his cronies' wealth. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.